All right, I think we can go ahead and start the press conference now. Thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, these are our uh, human rights mandates on torture um, that have just presented to the third committee of the General Assembly. Uh, we've got Mr. Jens Modvik, uh, who is the chairperson of the Committee Against Torture, Mr. Malcolm Evans, um, the chair of the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, and Mr. Niels Melzer, uh, who's a special rapporteur on torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. Um, I'm just going to pass the floor to them. Uh, each of them will deliver a very short statement, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, let's start with uh, Mr. Jens Modvik, please, the chair of the Committee Against Torture. Thank you very much. The Committee Against Torture is the custodians of the Convention Against Torture, a legally binding uh, instrument to uh, ensure that torture is effectively prevented and that victims obtain redress. Uh, the way we work is that uh, countries that have uh, ratified the Convention, that's 162 by now, uh, have an obligation to regularly report to the committee uh, every four years. They have to give an account of how the Convention is implemented, all the obligations in the Convention, what, what they have done. And that is followed by uh, the committee considering this report in a dialogue over two days with a Q&A session with a delegation uh, from the country in question that comes to Geneva uh, and meets with the committee. Of course, what we focus on is uh, implementation. That is, it's not enough to, uh, to have a report and we issue conclu conclusions, we make recommendations to the state party. We do it in public. Everything is public here. We have webcasts that of all the dialogues with the state parties and our concluding observations are public. <clears throat> so we, of course, also consider what goes on between reporting periods, and we have follow-up procedures that are focusing on the implementation of the uh, recommendations that we have made. And I must also say we rely a lot on civil society and national human rights institutions in order to assist us both in the review of countries and in the implementation of uh, its, uh, our recommendations. So that would be... Uh, very brief introduction to what, what is the Committee Against Torture and what do we do. Thanks very much. We'll now pass the floor to Mr. Malcolm Evans, the Chair of the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture. Thank you. Um, we are a very different sort of committee. In some senses, our committee actually has what is arguably the most powerful human rights mandate that has yet been established within the United Nations system. Um, in relation to those states which are a party to the optional protocol, the committee which I chair and which comprises 25 um, um, members has got the power to visit any country which is a state party to the optional protocol at any time that it wishes to go to any place of detention that it wishes to go to whenever it wishes to do so, to speak to whoever it wishes to speak to in confidence and in private, to see any part of any premises that it wishes to look at and to see any form of documentation or inside any lock room, lock cupboard or whatever it wishes while it's there. This is actually quite powerful. Um, Regretfully, we are not able to exercise our mandate, perhaps as frequently as we would wish, when it is of such, um, you know, su such power. But it is, I think, quite remarkable that, first of all, we do have such a mandate, and that, in fact, we are able to exercise it effectively and efficiently um, on, a, on, a, on a routine basis. Um, equally importantly, the optional protocol also requires each and every of the state's parties to it to establish a national mechanism, a similar body at a national mechanism, that should also be able to do precisely that. Of course, there is a price that one pays for having such a remarkably powerful mandate, and the price that we pay is that our work is confidential. The reports that we produce following our visits are confidential to us and the state, as is the discussions and the dialogues that we have arising out of it. On the other hand, states are 
um, free to publish, authorize the publication of the reports and the material concerning our dialogue if they wish. And the good news is about half the countries that we go to do ultimately agree to the reports being, being published. And we obviously encourage that because it makes um, life a lot easier to be able to have a discussion that you can draw on and others can to and draw on that work too when it's in the public domain rather than private. We currently, as a committee ourselves, visit um, around about 10 countries um, a year. Um, as I speak, teams are assembling for the next two visits, which commence next week, one in Rwanda, another in Spain. Um, during the course of the last 10 years, as I mentioned in our statement this morning, our committee will have visited hundreds of places of detention and spoken to thousands of detainees, where where whilst the national mechanisms, which are part of our overall system, um, if you add those in, will have visited tens of thousands of institutions and spoken, um, thousands of institutions and spoken to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of detainees. So a huge amount of work about understanding what is going on in places of detention is taking place within the, within the OPCAT framework. As I say, it is a remarkable instrument. 85 states are currently party to the optional protocol. We wish there were very many more. Thank you. Evans, um, we will now pass on to Mr. Niels Melzer, who is the Special Rapporteur on Torture and Other Cruel and Human and, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Uh, just to mention that a press release was put out by the Special Rapporteur, which is in the back of the room. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, obviously when we speak about the provision of torture, we usually understand it as something that refers to ill treatment carried out against persons that are in prison, that are detained, deprived of their liberty. And that obviously is one of the most dangerous uh, situations where that the risk of abuse is highest. However, I felt that it was important to point out that the prohibition of torture and other ill treatment is not limited to the, to the context of detention. My mandate has consistently held that the prohibition of torture and cruel and human degrading treatment or punishment is not confined to acts carried out against persons deprived of their liberty, but that it also covers excessive police violence and other ill treatment against persons that are not in the custody of the state. Therefore, my current report focuses on precisely that area and makes clear that arbitrary police violence can amount to torture and other real treatment even if it takes, uh, outside, uh, takes place outside prison walls. More precisely, any unnecessary, excessive or otherwise arbitrary use of force by law enforcement officials is incompatible with the prohibition of cruel and human or degrading treatment and where such force intentionally or purposefully inflicts pain and suffering on powerless individuals who are unable to escape or resist it always is conclusively unlawful and may even amount to torture. So therefore, obviously, states have to ensure that their law enforcement agents are trained, instructed, and equipped so as to avoid any such arbitrary force and to give priority to nonviolent means in carrying out their duty. So if the use of force is unavoidable, which obviously can happen in practice, then state officials must exercise restraint and act in proportion to the seriousness of the offense and the legitimate purpose to be achieved. Now, in addition to the actual use of force standards, even specific weapons and riot control devices used by the police and security forces can themselves be inherently unlawful. And that is the case when uh, it is specifically designed or if it's of a nature, that is, it has no other practical use really than to uh, employ unnecessary, excessive, or otherwise arbitrary force, or to intentionally or purposefully inflict pain and suffering on powerless individuals. To summarize it, overall, my report clarifies that arbitrary police violence is not just bad policy, but it amounts to torture or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, and that any tolerance, acquiescence, or impunity for such abuse amounts to a serious violation of international law. Thanks. I'll be happy to also answer any questions you might have in that respect. Self, before you ask the question, please go ahead. And, uh, and to, who's, um, to whom the question is directed, please.
much, once to Mr. Evans. Uh, I'm Evelyn Leopold, Huffington Post contributor. Um, I, uh, you mentioned you were going to Rwanda, is that correct? Yes. Because they've recently been, I, I looked at the protocol, I didn't say 85 names, but anyway, uh, I, they recently have been accused of, of quite a bit of torture of prisoners. Is that one of the things you're going to look at? And then to the rapporteur, the, um, the arbitrary police violence has lately been attributed to Kenya and to Spain in Catalonia. Is that something you're looking at? Well, if I take the first part first before um, passing on, you mention um, Rwanda. Um, the way the optional protocol works is through prevention. Um, our means of, of working is to go into places where persons may be deprived of their liberty, to see um, what the, the actual situation is based on our own personal first-hand observations and, and interviews with, um, with detainees um, and, and other staff and others working in, in those places. We are not investigators as such. So we do not go to a country in response to a particular incident or set of allegations. Um, we, our mandate is that we should be trying to assist in the prevention of torture by um, a, a program of visits that should be going to all of our state's parties, and we do on that basis. So we are certainly not going to, um, to Rwanda in response to any particular set of allegations or sets of circumstances, and it is not what we do to spend our time, um, shall we say, following up specifically on any particular um, Set of, set, set of claims. That being said, of course, what we are always trying to do within a country is to understand as best we can what the incidence of torture and ill treatment may be, what the drivers of torture and ill treatment may be in that particular setting, and what can and should be done about it. Our role is not to as such hold people to account but to try to make sure that there are the means and mechanisms in place to ensure that that is possible and of course that there is less likelihood of such ill treatment occurring in the first place so we are not going we do not go to any country to investigate any specific allegations our visits are not triggered um, in that way but obviously in the course of any such visit we would be um, interested to discover what there is to learn about whatever um, the, the current situation may be within that country as regards such activities it is what we are there to do thank you Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you for your question regarding uh, arbitrary police violence. Obviously, it has been uh, a, uh, made a, a topic in uh, the media lately for the two countries you have mentioned, for Kenya and Spain. And um, in both cases, uh, I have uh, addressed it uh, in uh, my interventions with, with the governments. But that's not the only cases. Uh, it is an issue that I've tried to more systematically address with, with uh, states, always on the basis that obviously what we receive from public sources are, is, is one set of information, and then I try to engage in a, in a dialogue with the authorities to see what their position is on, on that and their, their views on, on, on these allegations. But I, I do feel that it is a very important issue to take up because um, as I said before, that we have traditionally um, uh, had a very strong focus on custody and, and, and imprisonment and interrogation, and that remains a, a very serious concern, but we should not forget that there are millions of people that are marginalized, that live in situations where there's virtually no supervision of how the interaction between them and security forces in, in the daily practice actually works, and there's a lot of abuse happening, a lot of extortion happening, and a lot of, uh, of, of uh, yeah, abuse that you can only describe finally as, as torture, uh, including sexual violence and, 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 and other types of, of, of grave violations of personal integrity. 
if I may, I would just like to compliment that this is exactly where our mechanisms are complementary because the countries we mentioned, they would have to make an account to the Committee Against Torture and they would have to be accountable on allegations that torture takes place. So in that sense, we have complementary approaches and strengthen by synergy. Uh, hi, my name, thanks for the briefing. My name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. Um, I have two questions. The first one about um, Israel and um, torture in Israeli prisons against Palestinian political prisoners. Were you able to get there to make any investigations? And on this regard, also in the last um, report of the UN conflict and uh, children and uh, armed conf in armed conflict, there was uh, the mention that um, the UN was able to document about 185 uh, incidents of ill treatment of children uh, that were detained by Israeli forces. So would you elaborate more on that? And regarding police, if you were able at all to be there and why not? And regard, uh, regarding uh, the use of um, excessive uh, force by police, what about the US? Were you able to do something in this regard, investigate, especially against um, the use of force police against African American and minorities? Thank you. Well, if I go first, if only because on this I can be remarkably brief, neither Israel nor the United States are parties to the optional protocol. Um, and so um, our, our mandate is not one that we can exercise in, in relation to them. Just to say in parenthesis, you mention uh, the question of children in detention more, more generically. This is, of course, um, a thematic issue which is of great uh, concern to us. It is um, worthy of, of note and remembrance that uh, the United Nations has um, um, agreed to set up a global study into the situation of children um, in, in, in detention. And I do hope that that is uh, able to be progressed. I regret to say my understanding is that there are difficulties with progressing it for once again the normal problem, lack of financial capacity to be able to do so. Um, and so I, I do hope that that is an issue that can be resolved because the problem is a hugely important one and very pressing indeed. Mr. Modvik to, um, to also answer the question and then I'll pass the floor to the Special Rapporteur. Uh, the Committee Against Torture has reviewed the U.S. in 2014 and Israel in 2015, I believe. And uh, both the questions you mentioned, the question of police brutality in the U.S. and uh, of treatment of Palestinian prisoners in Israel were very clearly, severely addressed. And if you want details, it's in the concluding observations that the committee issues on both. I remember clearly because I was rapporteur for the U.S., that uh, the com committee recommended that more accountability of the police would be established in order to prevent the issue of pr police brutality, particularly in vis-a-vis uh, -vis ethnic minorities. Can I follow up? I think I can also be brief on this one. I have requested visits, country visits for both countries, uh, Israel and and the U.S. In the case of Israel, I have not received any positive response. In the case of the U.S., I've received a positive response, but not, uh, they were not prepared to respect the, the terms of reference that I w would have required. So I, I could not carry out the visit. Uh, yes, I, uh, I have requested visits, country to carry out ca country visits in Israel and in the United States. Uh, Israel has not uh, provided a positive response to that request and uh, the U.S. has invited my mandate to visit, but not, uh, was not prepared to respect the terms of reference that uh, we require as a minimum for the modalities of, our, of, of the visits. Could, could you elaborate more on that, exactly what you asked for and what they didn't want to give you? The main issue remains the same that also my predecessor had, is with regard to Guantanamo and the ability to conduct confidential interviews with the prisoners there. Okay, we have a question here, then there, and then here. Thank you. Uh, Carla Stay, Global Research. I have two questions. It's a little bit confusing because I think you just said is, uh, the United States is not a party to this, but if they've signed and ratified the Convention Against Torture, 
um, to what extent are they held accountable? There were reports in the New Yorker magazine recently and in the New York Times of prisoners in jail, regular jails, and in mental, well, mental institutions who are actually forced into showers with boiling water and in cases, in the cases I've read of, uh, or that were reported in the New Yorker, uh, several instances they were boiled to death. Um, I count, I think it was within this year that the New Yorker reported this. And recently I saw something in the New York Times. Um, so I was wondering whether you have the ability to look into the, to investigate this. And of course, anyone in these institutions who's aware of it and opposed to it either gets fired from their job or is threatened uh, not to say anything. So it, I understand from the New Yorker article, it's very difficult getting information. And probably the same thing with the New York Times. And this is a separate, uh, this is a, just a follow-up question. Uh, there is a Saudi Arabian journalist, Raif Badawi, who was sentenced to a thousand lashes and 10 years in jail for criticizing, I believe, the Saudi um, religious establishment or some of their practices. And this has been a number of years ago, uh, and I've raised this issue. I know my colleague um, from Egypt has raised this issue. Uh, is anything being done to keep this guy from being subjected to the most unspeakable torture? And again, is this are these forms of punishment? I assume they're considered um, cruel, inhuman, and degrading. Uh, I find it strange that Saudi Arabia is on the Human Rights Council if this is a practice, but then it's a practice that is uh, authorized by Sharia law. So I understand one is not permitted to practice to criticize religion here. Yes, Mr. Melzer, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, on the possibility, uh, on the, the abuse that you refer to in, in, in U.S. prisons, uh, uh, obviously, is it possible to investigate this? Um, oh, excuse me, perhaps I should start first because you, you were slightly confused about the, the different convention systems. Now, I'm, I'm the only that one that has a mandate that's not based on the treaty, so maybe I'm not the best person to explain, but the Convention Against Torture is something that the U.S. has ratified. But then the, there's an optional protocol that establishes the subcommittee that is then entitled to carry out visits to the detainees. So not every state that has ratified the torture convention or anti-torture convention would have to allow these visits in. They would have to ratify an additional treaty, an optional protocol that then allows these visits to happen, and that the U.S. has not done. So they are, if they're bound by the, the treaty, but they're not obliged to accept any visits uh, monitoring the respect for that. So my mandate is not based on a treaty, a specific treaty, but to monitor uh, compliance with the customary, general, generic prohibition on torture in all states, even those that have not ratified any treaties. And so that is one of the strong points of my mandate. The weak point is that states are not obliged to accept my visits either. I, I'm just entitled to ask for access. So I, in a sense, yeah, it is, it is, it is a bit a, a, a dire uh, situation in terms of legal obligations to, to, to accept uh, moni external monitoring. Um, that being said, my main bait certainly would be uh, stand ready to, to examine any allegations that we receive in my office with regard to the type of abuse you just referred to. Uh, it's just that I, I can't in, you know, investigate or examine or address all issues that are mentioned everywhere in the public sphere all the time because it, it's just too much. So the practice is that I react to allegation letters and uh, complaints uh, that I receive to my office and then with my team we look at this and, and consider uh, carrying out interventions when, when there are credible allegations of, of, of abuse. But that certainly that, that pattern you refer to would be something that uh, would, would, would trigger uh, uh, questions to, to the involved states on the part of my mandate. Um, the issue with that you referred to with corporal punishment and the Sharia in Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the problems is that the, 
the definition of torture excludes uh, pain and suffering that is inherent or incidental to a lawful sanction. Obviously, because torture can also constitute mental suffering, we mean, for example, the suffering inflicted by imprisonment as a punishment is not necessarily torture, just because any imprisonment implies and involves a certain amount of suffering. But then now we have states that then say, well, in our country, corporal punishment is legal, so we consider that to be a lawful sanction and therefore not to be torture. Um, Personally, I don't agree with that analysis, but it's one that states are making. Other states are saying, well, in our states, uh, death penalty is lawful. It's a lawful sanction. So the pain and suffering that's necessarily inflicted by the execution of the, the, the death penalty or the so-called death row syndrome, that that is not torture in their view. Again, personally, I don't agree. I feel that there is something inherently cruel and human and degrading about this type of punishment. But that is just the reality that the parties to the treaties disagree as to how they want to interpret a lawful, what, what can be a lawful sanction and therefore would not be a, a, a torture. Um, sorry, Mr. Mondvig, to supplement. Just very quickly, while we would not react to an event that you mention like this because we don't react to events in newspapers. We would, though, on the regular reporting of the U.S., that would be in 2018, uh, we would take this into consideration in the dialogue with the, with the U.S. and ask for uh, this event and what has been done uh, to prevent it further and to compensate. So, but it would be this four-year reporting cycle it would uh, be included in. Thank you. The gentleman in the gray suit. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. For, thanks for the briefing. I am, my name is Mushfiqul Fazal. I am from Bangladesh representing Just News BD. And uh, the, uh, torture and disappearance is a common phenomenon of Bangladesh. And the present government of Bangladesh is trying to keep the power by to eliminate the political opposition. Just It is reflected by the Amnesty International, Human Rights Search, and all, all other human rights organizations. Just uh, January <laughs> to August 2017, just uh, for this month, according to ASK report, 49 people were abducted in Bangladesh. This is the scenario of Bangladesh. So uh, how you will address this situation of Bangladesh? It, it, torture is going on and has disappeared the... Uh, the situation is like that. Thank you. Um, just to say you're going to think that our, our mandate is peculiarly useless. Bangladesh is not a state party to the optional protocol, so it doesn't really fall within our, our, our sphere. I get rather tired of having to say this so, so frequently. But it is worth pointing out that you can see from a systemic point of view, and I think this is a point that does need to be, you know, to, to be picked up a little bit more. You know, we have this incredibly powerful mandate, but only in relation to those states which up front have agreed to it. Uh, NILS has got the more overarching mandate, but of course can only exercise it in those countries that agree for it to happen. Um, uh, Jens, of course, as chair of the CAT, has got a different sort of mandate with very many any more states parties but as he explained has to respond you know responds in a different way through the reporting cycle and, and so on and so whilst between ourselves we would at least have opportunities to pick up um, in some way on most things it is certainly true that there are still gaps within the preventive within the overall framework that does allow some states not really to be subject to the scrutiny and challenge in relation to torture and ill treatment that would arguably uh, well not arguably that would definitely be necessary from point of view of my mandate certainly that if I if I receive allegation uh, letters uh, that uh, are well based uh, that describe the type of situations you refer to I that certainly would consider uh, carrying out an intervention but to my knowledge uh, uh, I would have to check with my office but uh, to my knowledge I have not received such an allegation letter um, uh, and such a complaint on Bangladesh but it certainly would be a, a topic I could intervene on and and would if I receive uh, consolidated uh, allegations on that 
Yes, Mr. Mudwig, if you could supplement, please. <clears throat> yes, Bangladesh is a state party to the Convention Against Torture, so at some point they will be subjected to the scrutiny that would involve uh, these things. It makes me mention that actually the Committee Against Torture has a uh, an interesting mechanism as well in our Article 20, which is when we receive information that uh, torture is systematically practiced in a country, and this country has accepted our competence in the Article 20, we can do a confidential inquiry. And this inquiry would uh, typically mean uh, travel to the country, but also a complete review of material on torture. And actually, in this year's uh, uh, annual report, we published a resume of an Article 20, that is a uh, confidential inquiry that we have been doing uh, on Egypt uh, starting in uh, 2012 and was concluded this year. And of course, we can't say much more about it because it's still confidential, but we have published and we are allowed to do that. Uh, we have published a summary of the inquiry where we concluded that torture is systematic, uh, systematically practiced in Egypt. So we do have this mandate. Just a supplement. May I know who is, uh, 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 from where you are uh, asking for this uh, application or something like that, you know, to, to deal with that? Um, I, I, I can receive... Uh, these individual complaints from individuals that are at risk or consider that they are at risk, they can write informally. At, it's not dependent on any judicial proceedings. Uh, it's an informal tool um, that they can do through uh, email, for example, uh, individually. Family members can do it. NGOs can do it. Lawyers can do it. So it, it, journalists could do it. Uh, so in a sense, it's a very informal tool. Um, that uh, and, and can be very efficient because I'm also myself an independent expert and can decide within a few hours whether I want to intervene and at what level I want to intervene. So it can be a very flexible uh, and, 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 and uh, useful tool to react quickly. Uh, the disadvantage being that states are not legally obliged to uh, comply with whatever requests I, I, I make. Sure. Thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks for the briefing. Let's take, let's, but here's an example then for, for that. Uh, it has to do with Cameroon. In Cameroon, there's a, there's a report out today by Amnesty International that up to 500 prisoners since these Anglophone protests have taken place are locked up like sardines. People were shot in the foot. Some people were thrown out of a helicopter. So this is all, I, I guess I would refer you to this Amnesty International report as a, as a complaint. And I guess maybe give me, give as an example, how quickly then the UN is talking about sending a, a political advisor, Mr. Fall, there, but how, how would it go about if you, if you see allegations such as are detailed today by Amnesty International about an ongoing situation of torture in a country that the UN has said that it's providing good offices to, what do you do next? Um, when I would react when Amnesty International, for example, contacts my office to do that. Um, uh, obviously, public sources can raise concern, and I can then also contact the government and, and ask them for further information on that. The problem simply is, and I have to be very honest about this, I, I have two staff members, and I have to cover the whole globe. So when an organization that is as professional and, and systematic as Amnesty International comes out with a very uh, well-based and consolidated report, um, there is little added value I can have in making an immediate intervention. The, the, it's out in, 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 the, in the public sphere, and states can pick, and other stakeholders can pick up that information and act upon that. If I feel I can have an added value, by requesting to do a country visit and uh, with a reali realistic prospect that that will be accepted, I, I will do so. But again, I have the budget to do two country visits per year. My priorities will always be to visit countries that SPT cannot visit um, because these are not parties to the convention. My priority will be uh, to, to raise cases that no one is aware of. So if something is very prominent in the public sphere, I will tend not to address it on top of everything else if other cases are there that need to be addressed that no one is aware of. So that shows a bit of the, the, the reality of, of my work. Right. 
these people are still locked up at like sardines. The report just came out today. So I'm just raising, I, I raise that to you. as a and, and absolutely, I, it's not to say that, it, the question is just if, if I intervened immediately, would that change anything? Or it's, it's, it's resources that I have to try to apply there where I can actually change something or where, uh, where, where I feel my, my, my added voice will have an effect. And uh, obviously abuse of the type that you're mentioning is always um, horrifying, and there is much more going on of this in the world that we can possibly be aware of. And I just want to take this opportunity to point out that my, my next report to the Human Rights Council in spring will be on migration-related torture, and there we have millions of people that are completely marginalized and don't have access to the criminal justice system. No one even knows that they're who they are, they're not registered, they can disappear with impunity. And they do disappear with impunity. And before they disappear, lots of horrible things happen to them. And that's not confined to a specific region. I've done regional consultations around the world, and it is everywhere. What happens to irregular migrants is a, a topic that I feel I have to take up and you know, put the spotlight on because not that no one else is doing it, but in terms of the torture and the ill treatment aspect, these are people that others don't have access to because their mandates are specifically designed to address a prison system or ICRC armed conflict or something like that. So just to... Uh, one last, just one last follow-up on the thing that you just raised. Have you spoken with EU countries that fund the, the, the stopping of migration in Libya, for example, to ensure that their funding isn't used for the type of detention you're describing? That is a huge issue for me. I have uh, done a press release together with the Special Rapporteur on the Right of Migrants uh, um, uh, protesting against the agreements that the EU has made with some of the armed groups in, in Libya. And uh, I uh, intend to take that up in the future uh, more intensely because that, that is a, a very uh, controversial issue. Okay, we've got uh, oh, three more questions and then we'll have to wrap up. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, to come again. Thing. Thing. Uh, I'm Evelyn Leopold and let me welcome you, which I didn't do earlier, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Um, I um, I don't want to belabor Rwanda, but I'm uh, I, it's because you brought it up that it reminded me. I'm not sure of your whole procedure. For example, Human Rights Watch put out a chilling um, report on talk in Rwanda, in Rwanda and executions and whatnot. And do any of you look into that? you're going to be there. I'm just curious. And then, yes. And then, do you, as you notice, we all like samples of countries. You've been asked that in every single question. Do you have any, as, as the rapporteur, do you have any example of people who just disappear? You, as you just mentioned, that was quite frightening and nobody knows where they are and who they are. Naturally, whenever we go, as I said before, we don't go to countries with the deliberate intention of investigating, but obviously we are not going to go, when we go to a country, for whatever reason, we are not going to go on an uninformed basis. So, of course, we will spend a great deal of time amassing what information there is uh, to be amassed concerning the... Um, the, 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 you know, the situation in the country generally, uh, and of course that will be taking into account reports uh, of those available from within the UN system, from my colleagues, for example, but other special procedures from within other regional human rights mechanisms. Um, in the case of um, Africa, the um, uh, Committee for the Prevention of Torture in Africa, the Africa Human, um, human Rights Commission, and so on and so forth, as well, of course, as reports from civil society and NGOs both based within the country and outside of it. And all this information and naturally will be looked at and used to inform how best we use our time when we are in, in, in a country. Um, so, so the short answer to that question is, of course, we will be aware of such things, and of course, um, they will be um, they, they, they will be on our mind. Um, 
I, I think, you know, perhaps more generally, um, you know, and perhaps pulling in, you know, some points about the, 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 the previous question, if I were to look more holistically at the work that we do, and I suspect my colleagues would agree with me on this, we tend to operate... No, I don't mean we, te we tend to operate. I think people generally tend to respond to incidents such as that which you've mentioned and others as if somehow these are shocking aberrations from, from, you know, from the norm. They are certainly shocking, um, but I regret to say they are not so aberrant as people seem to assume. And, you know, the one thing that perhaps shocks me most over the many years' work that I've done in the field is the extent to which so many of the, of, of the things that we just assume will take place in a, in a normal criminal justice detention or any other system just don't happen that way. And that we fool ourselves a lot by talking about nor normal systems and processes when such systems are not normal. And that things that we think are shocking and horrific, regretfully, are actually the norm in so many places so much of the time. And um, I do think we, we need to, should we say, be mindful of those realities when we go about doing our work. And yes, indeed, working out how we respond to specific instances that, shall we say, gain the public, public profile and public imagination. It isn't to say that they are not important. They are. But there is a risk that by concentrating on, on the few and the high profile, the vast bulk of the um, amounts of ill treatment and torture that take place just on a routine basis as a matter of course and not necessarily all the time with just com it, it just more unthinking because this is the way in which things are done uh, needs to be addressed too you know the vast amount of torture and ill treatment that takes place in the world is just unthinking and routine because it is just what happens and in some ways that's the most shocking thing of all yeah thank you with regard to your question with regard to the disappearances I it's obviously I, I, I do get 10 to 15 in, uh, requests for urgent appeals per day from around the world and this is and this is probably just the tip of the iceberg anyway so and uh, not all of them re refer to or uh, to disappearances, of course, but some do. Um, uh, very frequently, what we see is the uh, the method of or the, the tool of incommunicado detention that is being used by states, and where then family members still simply don't know where the purpose uh, the person is, whether they have really disappeared for good, or where, whether they will just turn up again in the criminal justice system at some point. Um, but I, I do think that the biggest kind of dark area there are irregular migrants because they are not in their usual environment. Because when someone disappears in their <coughs> usual environment, there are plenty of people that can complain about it. It's their family, it's their employer, it's their you know, friends, it's their contacts. Uh, and, but people on the move, they're outside of their usual environment. Um, they are outside of the, their social network. They're outside of any kind of registered uh, system. Um, as I mentioned before, they, they rarely ever get into the criminal justice system, although thousands do, but this is just a small percentage of the actual numbers we have. What, and, and it's not just you know organized criminals, uh, people smugglers, and other non-state actors that are carrying out the abuse. We also, in very... Um, progressive states, usually with regard to human rights, um, we see that they increasingly base themselves on, they have these deterrence-based migration policies, uh, criminalizing uh, illegal entry and so on, uh, to extent that migrants are encouraged to stay outside of the, the system. They want to stay below the radar where all kinds of things can happen to them and no one ever notices when they disappear. Um, so. How, how to address this in practice, I don't know. I, do, I, I feel that the first step must somehow be to register these people. In the past, when I used to work for the, the, the ICRC in armed conflicts, the first thing we would do with, in prisons is to register people to make sure we know they exist, they cannot disappear. And I feel with the migrant status, <coughs> the, the biggest issue that no one actually knows 
who is on, who is on the move, where they are, how many they are, and if 30% of them are missing all of a sudden, no one will really know. So there's no accountability. Yes, Mr. Modvik, please supplement, and then we've got two more questions Thank and we'll wrap you. up. The Committee Against Torture will be reviewing Rwanda on 23 and 24 November this year. So they have submitted their uh, report, and we have received uh, shadow reports from civil society and other UN agencies, etc., as a basis for the review. And we will sit across the delegation from Rwanda and we will ask them questions both about uh, cases of torture and what has been done in terms of providing redress to these as well as uh, what has been done in terms of preventing torture. One of the things we take most interest in here is what we call the fundamental legal safeguards, the rights you have when you are deprived of your liberty. And that is the right to have a lawyer, the right to request and receive a medical examination, and the right to inform your relatives about your whereabouts. And uh, we now have research that shows that this is probably the most effective way of preventing torture if it's enjoyed in practice. So this is uh, what we are going to hold uh, Rwanda and many, many other uh, provisions accountable for. And at the end of our session, which is the 6th of December, we will issue a press conference with our concluding observations of what we found. So we have a big – in Geneva, yes. So we have a, a huge complementarity along the mechanisms here where SPT is visiting and we are reviewing according to the convention. Yes, please go ahead. And then. Oh, thank you. I'm Jennifer Peltz from the Associated Press, and I guess this is a question for Mr. Mudvig. Since you brought up the findings in the report from the inquiry uh, concerning Egypt, I hope you might just talk a little bit more about the significance of them and what you hope will come from them. I, I did just try to read it on my phone. It was a little small. Well, obviously, the overarching uh, objective here is to reduce and fight torture. That's clear. Uh, and uh, one of the ideas behind the Article 20 inquiry mechanism, I guess, is that it's a way of getting uh, the uh, worst cases of torture into the radar. Uh, the idea is also that this takes place in collaboration with the state party in question, much as possible as a dialogue, uh, and uh, we have, as, as you can see in the, in the resume, we have uh, issued certain uh, recommendations, and obviously this is the way we work. We make recommendations on how to make progress in the prevention of torture and the prevention of impunity by having constructive dialogues with the states. So, of course, it's also our hope here that we will be able to engage even more than was uh, possible during this inquiry, which you can see yourself, uh, that uh, Egypt will resume its uh, regular reporting to the committee and allow us to establish the constructive dialogue on how to prevent what was concluded to be systematic practice of torture. All right. Go ahead, please, on the last question. Yeah, hi, I'm Dulcie Leinbach from Pass Blue. Um, I had a couple of questions um, when um, Mr. Evans talked about the trends, if he could talk about um, what are the, the salient trends? What, what do you see happening? What are the commonalities of the drivers of torture? Do you see more torture incidences? Um, also, I, I'm not clear why some of these reports are confidential. Uh, do they just, I mean, if they're confidential and there's no follow-up, they just, they just, you know, fall into the, the great abyss of, you know, torture cases that nobody ever knows about. Um, and then also, um, where, where do women um, play, the population of uh, women, where do they come into the, the torture uh, dynamic? Are there, do you see more cases of women being tortured? Uh, is it mostly men being tortured? Thanks. Well, um, let's take the, the first the, one of the, the element about confidentiality uh, first. Yes, it's a it's a common sort of uh, approach that well, if what one's doing is confidential, it can't be of any who cares. It can't be any use. Well, I sort of have got rather a riposte to that. That um, actually, one of the easiest things in the world to do is actually to make public condemnations and then think that that achieves anything either. Um, and quite often, frankly, 
it often doesn't. And, you know, quite often, you know, a, a public denunciation of a situation can make it worse, not better. Um, I know my colleagues who are involved in this understand this fully. You, 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 you modulate what you're doing to what you're doing. Um, our work is confidential, but that has many advantages. First of all, it means that in confidence we can be extremely robust where that is necessary um, because of the confidentiality of the, of, of, of the setting. It also means that, of course, it's the, at one level, it's the price we pay for our intrusive mandate. The optional protocol deal, if you like, is trading this remarkable right of access an ability to, you know, to, to first-hand see with the need to be confidential about what we say. Now, that isn't to bury it. It's to enable, to open up a space where you can have a, perhaps a more honest and fruitful dialogue than might otherwise be happening than if it were, shall we say, in a public space where one would simply get, shall we say, uh, almost inevitably denial of what one is saying, etc., etc., or rebuttal. It's far easier, and I can assure you it happens, that, you know, when you were having a confidential discussion and you were putting things on the table in that way, people do not deny in the same way that they would do if you were doing it in a public setting. I have to say, you know, rarely are things that we say in our reports things that actually the state doesn't already sort of know. Because it puts it into a different area in terms of the conversation that we can have about it. After all, nobody likes having difficult discussions in public. Um, and all I can say is that some of the discussions that we have had have led to very, very positive change when if we were, I suspect that if we were having them in a more public setting, then there would have been more by way of confrontation, denial, etc., etc., rather than acceptance and saying, well, let's see what we can do about this, shall we? Now, of course, it's not all confidential in the sense that states are free to publish the reports if they choose to do so, and then you're going to say, well, if they're that hard-hitting, they're not going to make them public, are they? Wrong. Over half the reports that we have published have been made public, and quite frankly, when you read quite a lot of them, you know, they, are, they do not pull their punches in what they are saying. Um, but this, again, tends to come about when states then have had the time to have some discussion with us, understand what we are saying, and understand that we can make some, hopefully make some progress in relation to elements of this. So I would argue that just as we rightly, I think, stress that there's different approaches and um, complementarity across the system, the ability to have, shall we say, a more uh, a more confidential dialogue around, around these matters also has its part to play in being able to bring about positive change. Um, uh, I know so much of the human rights world, understandably, is all about openness and transparency, and at one level, of course, that is important. Much of what we do is all about openness and transparency. It is encouraging there to be greater openness and transparency around what occurs in places of detention. But in order to get that point, sometimes one does need to have some difficult conversations, and some difficult conversations are best taken place in a different place. Great. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we do have to wrap up now, but if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to get in touch with myself or Nenad, and we'll pass on the inquiries to the rapporteurs and the, uh, the committee chairpersons. Thank you.